and um, yeah, so um, Jennifer and Demian so kindly asked me to participate <laughs> in this um, arts lunch, which is good because I'm not sure if I would have made my way here otherwise, and this seems like a really cool place to be. So um, I'm thankful for that. And I don't, so basically what's gonna, when I originally did this um, presentation, we had been learning about Ernst Trelch, so it didn't really need a whole lot of explanation for people to understand the analogy. But since not everyone has done that, I asked if Demian could present on Ernst Trelch enough for people to get the connections between the two so that you can understand what I was actually doing with the presentation. So. Um, Demian's actually going to start and um, he'll pop in in the middle and at the end and um, so unless there's anything else we can just go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to share screen. And does everybody see a picture of Ernst Trelch there? All right. All right, Demian, go ahead. Okay. Exciting. Ernst Trelch, the historicist par excellence in the 19th century, defined historicism as the fundamental historicization of all our thinking about man, his culture, and his values. That's a direct quote. To put it more simply, historicism is the idea that all human phenomena are products of their histories and contexts. The modern philosopher, Frederick Beiser, clearly spells out what such historicism entails. And I quote, Roughly, to historicize our thinking means to recognize that everything in the human world, culture, values, institutions, practices, rationality, is made by history so that nothing has an eternal form, permanent essence, or constant identity which transcends historical change. The historicist holds, therefore, that the essence, identity, or nature of everything in the human world is made by history, so that it is entirely the product of the particular historical processes that brought it into being. The particular causes that have brought human things into being make them what they are, and these causes are utterly historical. That is, they depend on a specific context, a definite time and place. Hence, the historicist is the Heraclitian of the human world. Everything is in flux. No one steps twice into the river of history." End quote. In short, historicism refers to the thoroughgoing historicizing of modern consciousness. One of the most significant revolutions of modernity is the recognition that human beings are historical creatures and that everything human beings create, cultures, languages, moral and political systems, philosophies, religions, and so on, have been shaped by the contingencies of history and conditioned by the social environment in which they arose and continually developed. Needless to say, historicism had a profound impact on the study of religion and theology in the late 19th century, as scholars came to realize that religious traditions and theological concepts, including the Christian tradition and Christian theological concepts, are also utterly historical. The historical method, Ernst Trelch writes, acts as a leaven, transforming everything and ultimately exploding the very form of earlier theological methods, end quote. Trelch refused to elevate anything 
above the relativities and contingent flux of history and refuse to protect religion from the findings of critical historiography, whatever the consequences. Everything was subject to criticism. No historical event, tradition, text, or figure, <clears throat> no matter how sacrosanct, was exempt from historical critical treatment. So I'd like to invite you to listen to a story. The story that I'm going to tell you is not about Ernst Trouch. Rather, I've employed one of his favorite tools for understanding, that of analogy. How does what we experience and know serve as a guide to help determine what may have taken place in the past? How does our understanding of the development of one aspect of history and culture inform our understanding of the development of another? In this case, how does the development of art help us to understand the development of religion? Nothing in the story that I'm about to tell you is about Ernst Trouch, yet everything in this story is connected to what he taught about how religion develops. I'm going to try to shed some light and some color on how a historical consciousness informs us. This story is about a man who lived from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. You may recognize his self-portrait. A current of interconnections led to Claude Monet's place in history as one of the founders of French Impressionism. The gradual development of his art and eventual rise to fame came about despite many obstacles. They may never have come into being without John Rand, who designed a device that changed the possibilities for art. He found a way to put paint in a tube, thus making it portable. This technology allowed artists to leave the confines of their studios, where their quests for perfection and capturing the quintessential view lent itself to still portraits, such as this one. Plein air painting invited art outdoors. Artists embraced spontaneity. Artists began to paint everything they saw and how it felt to them. The possibilities were near endless for what could be painted, anything the eye could see. This painting of Monet's impression, Sunrise, eventually named the movement he helped bring into being. The brushwork used by the plein air painters in the outdoors changed, becoming looser in order to capture movement. Brighter colors reproduced sunsets, gardens, and water on their canvases. Their less structured form brought hostility from critics who saw it as vulgar and subversive, completely out of line from the artistic academic conventions. They found their style was sloppy, far too much like a sketch. In salon art, the art of the academy at the time, the point of painting was giving an objective portrayal of the real or the ideal. It was to offer a replica or the portrayal of an essence, a perfected, polished, and finished work of art. It was a quintessential representation, what most people would expect to see. You might say it was the belief that the norm of art was given Thus, in their minds, they could absolutize artistic values into unchangeable dogmas. It was not one way of doing art, it was the way. Nevertheless, amidst great opposition, the new movement continued despite the insult levied by an important art critic who reviewed the, first, the group's first exhibition and determined their work was nothing but a bunch of impressions. The Impressionists, far from being insulted, took ownership of the title and a new way of doing art. They did away with the notion of a finished work. They were a gr diverse group of painters who wanted to detach themselves from the Academy's conventions and believed that art was still art, even if it changed in its mode of expression. They formed a creative community that drank together in the cafes, painted together in the open air, and went on to revolutionize the world of art. This revolution may not have occurred had it not been for the financial support of Paul Durand Ruel, who bought scores of the Impressionist paintings in order to provide them with an income with which to work. 
He believed in their future success and worked tirelessly to create a market for them. He was so brilliant in the way that he made them successful, it forever changed the way in which dealers and artists did business. He became their caretaker and their bill payer. He became their advocate in the face of the attacks of the academy, the critics, the press, and even most of his colleagues. He put on exhibitions for them when the Academy of Fine Arts would not invite them, and even went so far as to come up with the idea of solo exhibitions for them. When all else failed, he finally found a market for them in the United States. Durand Ruel is the reason the US holds more impressionist works than any other country outside France. Renoir, who painted this portrait, said of him, Durand Ruel was a missionary. It was our good fortune that his religion was painting. All of these entangled events and individuals affected the evolution of thought, aesthetic values, and the future of art. From where we stand in the present, it is easier to see that through the course of time, one art movement grew out of or developed alongside another, and that a single artistic dogma could not be defended over time. The question remains though, is there a way to glean some transcendent meaning, an absolute truth within art that captures its essence? What if we were to place all the art movements side by side? We could compare them and see what correlations existed between periods. Would, be, would we be able to see clearly which was superior? Would that which was superior be that which was transcendent? Could our historically formulated opinion levy a final judgment? Is it obvious which is superior? Bouguereau, which I'm sorry I mispronounced, Monet or Van Gogh? Out of this multiformity, is it possible to determine which is true art? Damien? Ernst Trouch insisted on the principle of correlation. Religious traditions must be studied and understood contextually in relation to their own particular histories, as well as the larger history of religion and culture. We must not treat a religion as an isolated, unique, or self-contained phenomenon. Early Christianity, for example, must be investigated in relation to the context in which it arose and developed. The historical and comparative study of religion, according to Trelch, completely undercut the dogmatic assumption that the Christian religion is somehow exceptional, unique, superior, or ahistorical. That is the one and only religion founded on a transcendent revelation or authenticated by a supernatural authority that is outside of and contrary to history. He writes, and I quote, it is evident that Christianity in every age and particularly in its period of origin is a genuinely historical phenomenon, new by and large in its consequences, but profoundly and radically conditioned by the historical situation and environment in which it found itself, as well as by the relations it entered into in its further development." End quote. In the place of Christianity among the world religions, Trelch noted that diversity exists not only across traditions, but also within them. Christianity itself is internally diverse and historically fluid and always has been. It has morphed and changed over time. It has displayed a different character in every age and culture. For that reason, many theologians in the late 19th century sought to discover some sort of essence of Christianity, some common denominator, stable core, or essential meaning that lies beneath the cultural, historical, and theological differences. But Trelch problematized and complicated the search for an essence of Christianity. The historical study of religion has revealed that all religions including Christianity, are cornucopias, 
marked by wild variation, staggering multiplicity, and deep differences, even on central questions such as salvation and divinity. Thus, if we are to speak of the essence at all, writes Trelch, it cannot be an unchangeable idea given once and for all. Perhaps even more challengingly, when examined historically and comparatively, Christianity is seen as relative, not absolute, as one contingent development among others in the history of human religion. And the realization that Christianity is, like every other religion, the product of complex historical forces completely emasculates its claims to exclusive truth, finality, and superiority. Let's continue with Monet to see if Trelch becomes clear through analogy. Monet's genius was to look at things from unusual perspectives. He had an eye that refused to engage the scene in some sort of given way or represent it according to conventional expectations. To begin with, Monet denied that a subject presents itself from a normative point of view and thus denied that it must be represented in a predetermined form. He engaged his subject from all angles, as if in a dialogue with them. Instead of looking for a quintessential view, he asked what would a variation of views offer, including the unexpected ones? What if one was to engage the subject within a limited lens? The poplars were painted from a boat in the water, viewed from a space in the sidewall that impeded Monet's vision of the sky. This was not an unfortunate accident, it was how he approached his subjects in unexpected ways. He experimented by observing the same subject from different places or the same subject in the same place and observed what changed around it. He continued his work on perspective with the haystacks. He compared similarities and differences. The goal was not to show how one representation was superior, he showed all were expressive in particular and equally meaningful ways. He asked, what if it was embedded in a changing season? How would the weather affect it? Was there one view that was more valuable than the others or only more valuable for the viewer? Was this value rooted in the subject or in the connection of the viewer to the subject? Instead of conveying a repertoire of ideas about what was to be seen, Monet began to explore different ways of seeing. His paintings began to unfold a new way of interpreting the subject. His work spoke to the value in a diversity of perspectives. What he had explored was the expression in variations on a theme Understanding was not in the distilled and fixed, nor in a fleeting moment of revelation, but in complexity and multiplicity. He showed that there was more to be gained in a series on a subject with all its variations than could be gained from one representation trying to capture an essence. It begged the question, is the essence in fact the variation? After experimenting with poplars and haystacks and different points of view, Monet pushed the boundaries of exploration even further. He rented a room across from the Rouen Cathedral of Notre Dame, where he had a clear view of the countenance of the cathedral. Monet had experimented with subjects that moved. He had also introduced movement by changing his own viewpoint as he painted. The cathedral series fixes both the object and the point of view. The only change to be captured was that which happened in the envelope between the painter and the painted. He began his series of 30 paintings of the cathedrals, which he accomplished over a period of two years. Monet began to investigate a series of impressions, one subject through time. He depicted ongoing movement through different hours of the day and changing seasons, a multiplicity of the particular through time. 
Monet would have several canvases set up simultaneously and would move from canvas to canvas as he saw a particularity that he wanted to capture. Monet saw the value of the moment, but also each successive moment. There was something unique, worth remembering in each and different than the one before and the one that followed. He was not interested in exactness of form, but how the subject became new and became another. The actual subject was never lost because the actual was never permanent. The real is always a composite of variables. It was about each interaction and the meaning inherent in the multiplicity of interactions with the subject. There is much debate as to whether Monet was summoning all the symbolism of the cathedral in his work. Its depiction of the medieval conception of the visible presence of the kingdom of God on earth in all its power and magnificence, that which is supernaturally and eternally given, that which is authoritative and universal, and that which contains the essence of Christianity, presence of the divine. It is for us to consider whether his paintings raise the question of if there is an essential transcendent truth that can be distilled into a true religion outside of its place within history. I believe you could say that Monet's impressions were thoroughly worked out. And yet he said, anyone who says that he has finished a canvas is frightfully arrogant. Damien. Trelch argued that the essential meaning of Christianity in as much as it has one, must take into account and somehow incorporate the totality of its historical development. All the tensions and ambiguities, all the adaptations and reformations, all the conflicts and contradictions. Moreover, Trelch contended that the essence of Christianity is not so much discovered as it is constructed and continually reconstructed. Determining Christianity's essence is an ongoing and creative act, an interpretation that is influenced by personal and subjective factors and shaped not only by what Christianity is, but also by what it ought to be. To quote Trelch, to define the essence is to shape it afresh. It is the elucidation of the essential idea of Christianity in history in the way in which it ought to be a light for the future. The definition of the essence for a given time is the new historical formulation of Christianity for that time. There is within the definition of the essence a living new creation related afresh to new circumstances. And since it is a question of the recreation of the highest religious revelation, it is a new vouchsafing of revelation in the present." End quote. And that is it. There you have it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Demi, and thank you, Rebecca. We have lots of time for questions and conversation, um, which folks can put in the chat or just unmute yourself and hop on. Am I still sharing screen? You are. Okay. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Questions, comments, wonderings? Yeah, I, I have one. This is Don. And oh, yeah, what? Um, I just, how amazing to connect that um, to Monet, the, his artwork. Um, I just, uh, how did that come about? <laughs> 
um, who made the, how did that, yeah, and how did that connection get made? Because I just, um, it's just a great comparison. So, um, I guess I would say that I made those connections. Um, so those those photos that I that are of the cathedral, I took those. I was actually there, um, and um, it was kind of a personal journey for me. Um, I started to to leave the very traditional Christianity that I grew up in when I started to understand hermeneutics and different ways of seeing things, um, and art was very much a way that 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 sort of came about in my life. Um, I have a habit of visiting museums and um, spending time with paintings. Um, and when I learned about Monet and started reading about the trajectory of art, it, it seemed very much like my own journey in with, with, um, with religion and hermeneutics. So I actually just decided to go to Rua for a week and spend um, time with the cathedral. And um, there's also an amazing art museum there. Um, and so that connection came for me first. And as I was doing Ernst Trouch, it was just like, oh, <laughs> he talks about this. This is what he's talking about. And so for me, the the art and the um, the way in which Monet understood seeing was first and I made that connection to Ernst Trouch. Rebecca, this is amazing. Um, thanks so much for this presentation. One thing that I'm, uh, this is more, this is a comment, but one thing that I'm thinking about uh, is also that with the artist, if what you're seeing has to fit this one thing, if that's what the impressionists were challenging, then also the seer has to be one thing, the artist has to be one thing and, and one particular normative body. And I think of this because I'm dysgraphic and I can't do line work that ends easily. My hands don't work that way. Whereas impressionism opens that up for different kinds of bodies, different kinds of physicality to respond to seeing. And, and that brings up other things like if you're don't see color the same way if you don't know if you're colorblind if your height all these different things um and so I think that one of the remarkable things about this perspective and about what Monet brings to the table is that uh the the diversity you talked about that there are more bodies who can be artists now um when when we say what is seen can change who gets to see it also I think expands Yeah, I think um, I think even though I've been studying hermeneutics for a while now, I still feel like I'm constantly understanding how complex just seeing is, because you have so much complexity. You know, even when Monet situated like, and that's why the cathedrals are so interesting, right? Because he finally said, I'm going to find the most stable point of view. I'm going to stabilize my own point of view. And I'm going to keep everything the same, except that which is between the atmosphere between me and what I'm and what I'm painting. And um, that to me says so much about religion, about spirituality, about um, what is this thing we we have between us and and what I believe would be God and that there is so much complexity and diversity. How could one person possibly say there is a static or fixed view? Rebecca, could you uh, could you elaborate on that one just a bit? Um, I mean, we've had these conversations, but I think others in this in the Zoom room would would benefit from hearing your your story a bit. How how does this pr presentation and your reflections on Trelch, um, how do those actually illustrate the, the transformations that you've experienced in your own theology? 
right, or your own, the, the, the ways in which you relate to Christianity or the ways in which you, you see divinity even, see God. Oh my goodness, um, that's a challenging question. Um, so I will try to make this very brief, but I, I grew up in a very conservative um, Christian home. My parents were missionaries. So they had a very narrow and fixed idea of um, the text, of what it meant to read the text, um, that you know what the Bible says is true and only that which is said in the Bible is true. And um, so the idea was that that essence was to, you know, between us and God was to, to help people understand the truth, that very narrow truth. So um, for me, that, uh, that started to really not make sense as I started to understand um, life experience, um, relationships, they didn't fit into that. And yet I very much believed in God and wanted to understand something that would be um, uh, true um, about what I was experiencing in my relationship with God and, and my understanding of that relationship with God. Um, and so over time, I, I'm trying to remember, I think United might actually be my fifth seminary that I, that I attended because my views kept changing. <laughs> so I started out at, um, at Trinity and then ended up at Biblical and then at Bethel and then I, I guess United after that. And um, so I needed um, to learn from a place that kept having more options for understanding. Um, and so, you know, the way that that has um, sort of affected me and the reason that I'm back at United is I understand how oppressive that can be to, um, to be in a mental prison where you only are allowed to believe one thing about God or what God, um, what God says is true about you and who you are or what you can and can't do or who you can and can't become. Um, and so my, you know, this is a, this is huge for me is, is to offer people other options for belief um, and for seeing. Which by the way, that that's what is forming the, the foundation of Rebecca's dissertation project here at, at United is, is resisting what she calls, you know, uh, oppressive hermeneutics and supplying better, more liberative options. Uh, a theology that moves is the title of her final paper for this class. This was her midterm project. And then her final paper was, was a sort of larger theology uh, theology that moves that sort of undergirds this. Sorry, Rebecca, I know you're not going to talk about yourself. So that's why I just, or at least not brag on yourself. So that's why I wanted to throw that into the mix, but it's, it's truly great stuff. Um. I love the title of that paper <laughs> and that project in general, Rebecca. This is so rich and wonderful. I'm I'm curious about specifically like thinking about how, you know, Monet. I loved that image. Um, maybe that was just like a self portrait of him in his little boat, um, and just the idea that he was playing so much he would dedicate himself to this one subject, and then just devote. It was like a devotional practice of just observing it from different places and moving his own body and maybe staying more fixed. And I'm thinking right now about, you know, this time we're all kind of captured in where we're all a little bit more physically fixed in this pandemic. And, but there's still so much movement um, that we can access. And I'm just, I'm curious about like what your own interpretation 
um, or creative practice looks like now? Like, where are you finding movement? And I mean, you're clearly generating so much like creativity and thought in your in in your work still. And like, how do you how do you sustain that, or what does that feel like for you? You said so many good things there. Um, I really appreciate the the way you described devotion. And I think that's just even the way you just said that, um, you know, I grew up learning that to be devoted was to memorize, to, um, to, to regurgitate, to um, make sure that I had it right. Um, and what Monet brings to the table is obviously the opposite idea of devotion, which is to discover and to create and to engage. Um, so um, it, I will say that travel is huge for me. Like I love to travel and it doesn't have to be to France. Um, it can be, you know, to um, the Philadelphia Art Museum that's 45 minutes away, which is also not available right now, but um, I, I think it's really important. And I think this is a Trelch thing too, right? Is that we have to look outside of what is the norm to us. We have to experience difference and to understand things in their complicated um, evolvement. Um, so one of the ways that I'm doing that is by going back to seminary. <laughs> And, and I will say United is great for complexity and diversity. So it has been somewhat of um, a uh, challenging experience, which has been great, but also very challenging. Um, I think that, you know, the, the other ways that I do that are very diverse children's books. Um, I think are really great for giving us a different perspective on the world. Um, talking to friends about their walks and their uh, their times with nature and um, yeah, I mean, we do what we can here, but I think just opening yourself up to different viewpoints all the time is really helpful and and can be overwhelming, but also worth it. Thank you. Rebecca, I have to ask when you were on your uh, pilgrimage of sorts to the church, did you draw it or paint it while you were there? So no, because that is not at all my area of giftedness. I wish that it were. Um, I took a lot of photos um, which is, which is probably the most, um, in terms of um, technical thing that I do. But I tend to engage more with um, with words. Um, so I've written some poems, stuff like that. And um, although I don't know that you could call what I write technically poetry, I don't know. <laughs> Pat says I can. So if then if Pat says it, it's okay. <laughs> That says it. It's okay. <laughs> um, but probably mostly photos. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess what my honest response is that I do actually believe that hermeneutics is art. Demian agrees. <laughs> you're just nodding ferociously. Um, yes, I think I concur. I mean, I think that, that what you're talking about is really and why this presentation is so wonderful is that it's so um, it resonates with or is it like really reflects United's commitment and, and approach to these things, I think our approach to uh, the arts as well as our approach to theology and uh, and historical theology and so on. Theopoetics. Yeah. I mean, that's what this is. It's theopoetics. It's, it's a, a a resolute commitment to viewing both art and theology as a kind of theopoetic exercise. Yeah, we can't, I mean, and it's exactly actually, you know, in keeping with this, like the essence is the variation and um, what's the other one, the multiplicity of the particular. I think that um, 
we limit ourselves so much if we think of these as separate endeavors um, and they immediately, as your presentation shows, they immediately become enriched when we consider them alongside of each other, or even like kind of like interwoven in these kind of like impossibly complex ways. I mean, that's really the way that we have to deal with these things, I think, yeah. Um, and I had, would be remiss if I didn't say, I do think that you should go back when we can travel again. And I do think that you should give it a try to draw, draw the cathedral. I just have to, that's my, that's my job. <laughs> Kyle, yeah. Oh yeah, I wondered if I could follow up, Rebecca, and thank you for this really wonderful presentation. And Demian, thank you too. Um, if uh, I wondered if you would see a kind of analogy on the hermeneutics a comparison on sort of exploring the hermeneutics side a little more between impressionism as a kind of I don't know, an, uh, a kind of critical realism um, in hermeneutics where there is a reality, there's a thing that is stable, there's a cathedral, right, that has to be subjectively interpreted and, and seen through a particular lens, but yet there's still a thing that you're seeing, that you're describing, whereas maybe expressionism almost does away with the, the thing, or at least a, a sense of the thing as a fixed reality and focuses attention on the, the, no, the seeing eye or the, the subject of experience. Is that, have you thought about that connection as well? Kind of impressionism as critical realism, expressionism as anti-realism or kind of post-realism? Thanks for the easy question. Um, <laughs> and yes, I love, I don't think I would have used those words for it, but I do love the idea of thinking it, of it as critical realism, as long as I can insert in there that I don't think we ever have access to the absolute understanding of whatever it is that that is real. And so our access to that um, understanding is always, always going to be changing and hopefully enhanced by the multiple approaches to that. Um, so it, spending a week with the cathedral was the most amazing experience because I, I, I was in walking distance from it where I was staying and I could go at different times of day and in different weathers. And so like even walking in the cathedral, one day I'd walk past something and it was just gray walls and it was cold and dreary. And the next day I would walk by it and the sun would be coming through the stained glass windows and actually painting the walls. So there were, you know, there was color all along that same wall. And so, you know, you look at that and you say, there's so much variation that's brought about through so many different um, avenues. Um, the other thing that was really interesting is, um, you know, a cathedral, even though it is a thing, it's always crumbling. So there's this room that you could go in and you could see through the window and there were literally just chunks that were fallen off on tables and they were tagged and it reminded me of a morgue because it was like, it was like they, they were tagged, oh, this comes from this tower at this place in this time. So, so even though the cathedral is this thing, even the cathedral is crumbling and being replaced. And um, so it really does challenge the idea of, well, what is the real? And so for me, the way that I would say that's challenged me is, okay, if I believe that God is the real, is God the same real every time I access 
this relationship with God. So I, I, I don't know that I have <clears throat> answers to those questions, but um, it definitely does make the questions a lot more interesting. And also that just brought back memories from my thesis oral presentation. <laughs> I apologize for that. Yeah, I love, I love, I love that, Rebecca. I love the idea that the real is not stable, singular, but the real is evolving. The real is not fixed. The real is a multiplicity, not a unity. Um, it's real, but I, I like the idea. That's the part of realism that I, that I, I personally resonate with. I think Charles would resonate with. But if we take if we take history really seriously, as did Trelch, then I think that our notions of the real are not stable. It's not, not just our perceptions. Uh, what we're perceiving is itself a multiplicity and a plenitude inexhaustible. Oh yeah, Melissa. Oh, I just wanted to thank you. thank you, Rebecca. Um, it's very, very interesting, and Demian too. Um, and I may have missed something. I had to take a call a few minutes ago, so I may have missed something. But do, have have people talked about how response to art creates a reality, um, and then how does that reality get communicated to others? I, in a way. To me, Monet is communicating a reality or attempting to communicate a reality to a viewer. And then each of us as a viewer might see something different. Uh, the way Rebecca said, each time they passed the building, it looked really different. So has there been talk about that, about the reality created by the, by the audience or by the viewer? I feel like someone else should answer that question that knows more than I do. <laughs> I'm sorry if it wasn't very clear. No, it's, it's just, not it's that. Just it's just that I, I don't know that much about, um, I mean, I can speak maybe from a, a hermeneutics perspective, but maybe somebody who has more of a, an, a better understanding of art could speak better to that. Well, I guess, I mean, traditionally, and, and I speak under correction, of course, hermeneutics would claim to be able to interpret for others too, right? Not just a personal interpretation that there is some, when so, it's art, but it's also communicative in a way. Yes. So the author that, um, or the theologian hermeneutics interpreter that I find very helpful in that is Ricor, who um, engages with, um, uh, you know, we have this, every time we see something, then we have a multiplicity of possibilities that, um, um, a multiplicity of interpretations that comes from that. Um, and so um, you can't really hold a monkey by the tail. Um, once someone interacts with something, their experiences, their lives, their understandings interact with that other. And so he would say a myth or a narrative is formed that it's more than its separate parts and it becomes something new in itself. So I think if that is what you're talking about when you say a new reality is formed, I think that that's definitely true. Um, so in the way that we think um, hermeneutically about art, when I interact with the cathedral or when I interact with a cathedral painting, there's a whole lot more in that interaction than Monet could have ever foreseen or intended. And yet that is my reality. Um, and I can communicate this to you. And now Monet mo may hold an additional meeting for you than Monet held before this. And that is the real in terms of an experience. 
Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, but that was my best attempt at it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there's this wonderful talk by the director, Peter Greenaway. I think it was in Finland. It was, it was in a Scandinavian country. I don't remember where, um, where he's talking about the origin of film and then, um, and how it comes from visual arts, but then how it quickly got sort of taken over by story writing and narrative and write and the written arts and, and theater in particular. Um, and I think one of the things he talks about is it when when he shows like how it developed from visual arts is that it captures the change in things that's one of the things he talks about the mutability and i and i think that sort of idea that you brought up melissa and that you talked about rebecca of like creating this meta myth or this new myth is something that film can do so if you imagine all those cathedrals to me there's almost something filmic about them the way that when i'm looking from picture to picture and how i can see them transforming how i fill in that space in between each picture so i'm just thinking that there's a way that we're all that we can be producing these myths by piecing together um the art that we're seeing that by looking from one to the next to the next to the next we as the interpreter are creating a moving or co-creating a moving reality by engaging that way. Um, so that's something that I'm thinking about now. Uh, I'll try to find the link and put it in the chat. Also, I don't know if you noticed the last um, series of um, artwork that was up on the PowerPoint, but they are um, works by Roy Lichtenstein. And he actually took so Monet's sort of concept and created a very modern variation of them, um, something that Monet would not have been able to foresee because that kind of art didn't exist yet. Um, so that's- It was, it was mean, great, yes. thank you for sharing. Yeah. We have time for maybe one last comment or question if anybody has any <laughs> really difficult saving the work. No, just kidding. And Rebecca, you know, you did a great job answering that question. So I'm glad you didn't completely defer. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was great. And I think, in a sense, or maybe. And I, I meant to be asking the whole group, I, I didn't mean to pick on Rebecca. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I think that um, there are many ways where the, those kind of hermeneutical or interpretive questions that, you know, we can pose, can be posed to both images and, and texts in a way. And we often talk about like reading images even, and there's, um, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but I think there are many parallels, which is clear in your presentation. I think your approach to the images and what you've um, talked about today too, so. And just to make Demian happy, I will say a word about Ernst Trouch, and that is that the fact that he could see what he saw when he saw it was really before his time. I mean, before a lot of this hermeneutic theory had come out, he was already seeing things from a very, I think, um, just prophetic point to me if I can use that word safely. <laughs> yeah, he was thoroughly postmodern before postmodernism even existed. And, and I think prefigured a lot of those insights, really had a, a thoroughgoing historical consciousness, as as I hope you heard. Yeah, and you know, as so, and then I can't help myself, but I feel like I have to say when you when you're going to describe somebody from his period as postmodern i would say that's like anachronistic and why can't he be of his era as well it, of, yeah yeah he that 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 was almost it was almost an ironic point to say that yes. you know these insights are not new to like Jacques Derrida <laughs> right or the sort of a hermeneutical turn uh took place decades before 
uh, a lot of these theorists even arrived on the scene. So proto postmodern perhaps. <laughs> All right, well, we can keep talking about that, Damian, after I read your book. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks so much, uh, Rebecca. Thank you, Damian. Thanks for everyone um, who attended and discussed and uh, contributed questions and so on. This was really wonderful. Um, and thanks so much, Rebecca, for sharing your work with us today. Mm -hmm.